Well, if you would, please turn to me in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 5. Zechariah chapter 5. We'll be looking at the 6th and 7th of Zechariah's 8 visions. In the uh, almost two weeks since Donald Trump was elected president-elect of the United States, uh, if you spend much time on the internet, I advise against it. Really, but if you do, you've seen a great deal of uh, animosity in our country. It is a country divided. Um, see scores of liberals saying that Donald Trump and, and everyone who voted for him are racist and misogynistic and xenophobic and Islamophobic and homophobic and any other phobic that you can think of. Bigots, um, tools of the you know, rich and corrupt and wealthy, and that they're everything that's wrong with America. And the conservative response thus far has been effectively, I know you are, but what am I? There's not been much constructive discourse, and, and everybody is sure that it's the other guys who are ruining the country. The Israelites, in the days of Zechariah, were in much the same situation. There wasn't an election, but they were in dire straits. And most of them were quite certain that it was, it was the Persians' fault, or the Babylonians' fault, or the Philistines' fault. It's the peoples around us. It's all their fault. They're the bad guys. They're the reason why we're in such dire straits. They're wicked and evil, and it's all their fault. God doesn't allow this claim to stand. I mean, in this chapter, in Zechariah 5, God addresses the wickedness of the world. The first vision really deals with the wickedness of the Jews, the second with the wickedness of the nations. And it's, it's important very important for us to understand that we, we can never ever say that we're the good guys and they're the bad guys and there's no fault in us and everything wrong is entirely their fault the, the truth of the matter the very truth of Christianity is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God we all deserve death and Condemnation that the only hope for us or for anyone is the free gift of grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Zechariah 5, we deal first again with the sins of Israel and then with the sins of the world. Let's turn our attention to the text. Zechariah 5, verse 1. Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a flying scroll. And he said to me, What do you see? I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is twenty cubits, and its width ten cubits. Then he said to me, This is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land. For everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on the one side, and everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. I will send it out, declares the Lord of hosts. And it shall enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name. And it shall remain in his house and consume it, both timber and stones. And then the angel who talked with me came forward and said to me, Lift your eyes and see what this is that is going out. And I said, What is it? He said, This is the basket that is going out. And he said, This is their iniquity in all the land. And behold, the leaden cover was lifted, and there was a woman sitting in the basket. And he said, this is wickedness. And he thrust her back into the basket and thrust down the leaden weight on its opening. And then I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, two women coming forward. The wind was in their wings. They had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. Then I said to the angel who talked with me, Where are they taking the basket? He said to me, To the land of Shinar, to build a house for it. And when this is prepared, they will set the basket down there on its base. 
So we have two visions. Here, the first is a vision of a flying scroll. Zechariah looks, sees a flying scroll that is 20 cubits long and 10 cubits wide. And for those of you who aren't fluent in ancient Near Eastern measurements, a cubit is 18 inches, a foot and a half. Before they had standard items measurements, it was from your elbow to your fingertip. So you'd have longer cubits. It's a little taller than the rest of us. Not that we're bitter or anything. So this is 30 feet by 15 feet. That is pretty enormous for a scroll. It happens to be the same dimensions as the uh, the holy place within the temple and the size of, of Solomon's porch in the front of the temple. It's, it's enormous. It's be about half the size of this room here. Just a scroll. And the scroll represents God's written warnings against and punishments for sin. The, the angel says it very straightforward. This is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land. When the people came into the promised land, they received from the Lord a blessing and a curse. And blessings if they keep his commandments and curses if and when they disobeyed it. And those are written uh, for us in Deuteronomy 27 and 28. And I would invite you to turn there with me. Deuteronomy 27. The people are commanded to gather together. Half the people go up to Mount Ebal for the curse. Half go to Mount Gerizim for the blessing. This is Deuteronomy 27 verses 12 and, and 13. And once people are split, the Levites declare to all the men of Israel in a loud voice. Verse 15, Cursed to be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image an abomination to the Lord, a thing made by the hands of craftsmen, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who moves his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who misleads a blind man on the road, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his father's wife, because he has uncovered his father's nakedness. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with any kind of animal. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his sister, whether the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his mother-in-law. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who strikes down his neighbor in secret. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who takes a bribe to shed innocent blood, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who does not conform, confirm the words of this law by doing them, and all the people shall say, Amen. This isn't the only list of, of commandments given to the people, but it, it very clearly invokes a curse on the people if they do not do what God has commanded them to do it, and the, it's not imposed on them. The people agree to it. They say, amen. We will accept this charge. We will accept this curse, this responsibility, because they think they can do these things. The same thing happens at the end of, of Joshua. When Joshua puts it before the people, choose this day whom you will serve. If the Lord is God, follow him, and if not, all these other gods, and all the people say, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua says, you're not able to serve the Lord. They say, no, we will. We will serve the Lord. They, they have freely entered into this relationship, this covenant, blessings and curses. And then in Deuteronomy 28, 
God very clearly specifies what will happen to them when they bring this curse upon themselves. Uh, Deuteronomy 28, beginning verse 15. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and frustration in all that you undertake to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the pestilence stick to you until he has consumed you off the land that you are entering to take possession of it. The Lord will strike you with wasting disease and with fever, inflammation, and fiery heat, and with drought, and with blight, and with mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish, and the heavens over your head shall be bronze, and the earth under you shall be iron. The Lord will make the rain of your land powder. From heaven, dust shall come down on you until you are destroyed. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You should go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And you should be a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. And your dead body should be food for all the birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth. And there should be no one to frighten them away. The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt and with tumors and scabs and itch of which you cannot be healed. The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind, and you shall grope at noonday as a blind grope in darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways, and you shall be only oppressed and robbed continually, and there shall be no one to help you. You shall betroth a wife, but another man shall ravish her. You shall build a house, but you shall not dwell in it. You shall plant a vineyard, but you shall not enjoy its fruit. Your ox shall be slaughtered before your eyes, but you shall not eat any of it. Your donkey shall be seized before your face, but it shall not be restored to you. Your sheep shall be given to your enemies, but there shall be no one to help you. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people, while your eyes look on and fail with longing for them all day long. But you shall be helpless. A nation that you have not known shall eat up the fruit of your ground and of all your labors, and you shall be only oppressed and crushed continually, so that you are driven mad by the sight that your eyes see. The Lord will strike you on the knees and on the legs with grievous boils of which you cannot be healed, from the sole of your foot to the crown of your head. The Lord will bring you and your king whom you set over you to a nation that neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone. And you shall become a horror, a proverb, and a byword among all the people where the Lord will lead you away. And it continues. But it's summarized again in verse 45. All these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you till you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes that he commanded you. And that promise is, is repeated several times to Deuteronomy 28. This is the curse. The, the people of Israel didn't just have this promise in this history that, you know, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and I want you to do these things without any awareness of what would happen if they obeyed and what would happen if they disobeyed. They knew the curses. They knew the promises of God. They knew what would come upon them. And the people broke the law continually for centuries. And the Lord is slow to anger, and he sent them prophets, and he sent them good kings, and he called them to repent, but they continued to go further and further into their wickedness. And eventually the full weight of these curses came upon them, and they were taken out of their land, the promised land, the land God had given to them. And the northern tribes were taken into Assyria, and the southern tribes were taken into Babylon. And after 70 years, by the grace of God, the people of Judah, some of them, were sent back to Jerusalem. They had endured the curse. And perhaps they might have thought that, all right, we've just lived through the curses of Deuteronomy 28. They wanted to set 28 because they didn't have chapter divisions then. But we've survived the curses 
written in the book of the law. We, we've done it. It's, it's done. It's over with. They might have thought that, all right, now we're not under this obligation anymore. Now we can do whatever we want. We see some of this already in our, in our history. Uh, if we read Ezra and Nehemiah, the people, even though they didn't go after foreign gods, they very, very quickly began marrying foreign wives. They built their own houses rather than the house of the Lord. They sought their own good rather than the glory of God's name. And Zechariah is reminding the people that, that this curse that they've endured, even though that punishment was complete, the power of the curse was not over yet. This giant scroll still stands with punishment and vengeance for every sin against the Lord. It goes over the face of the whole land. Verse 3, For everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on one side, and everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. So we see first, again, it, it's a flying scroll. It's a giant scroll. It goes over the face of the whole land. It re reaches everywhere, and it reaches every one. No one's hidden from it. No one is excluded from it. If you're a part of the people of Israel, if you're in the land, you are under this curse. And if you steal, you will be cleaned out. If you swear falsely, you'll be cleaned out. Well, cleaned out is, is a pretty literal translation. It doesn't give us that good of an idea of what it actually means. It could have also be, been translated purged or emptied. The, uh, the Greek Septuagint, the ancient translation the Old Testament put that they will be avenged to death. And that's, that's clearly what's being communicated here. You're, you're going to be utterly consumed and destroyed by these curses. And these earlier punishments that you have survived are just a foretaste of the ultimate weight of the curse. There is more coming upon you if you steal if you swear falsely. And it's, it, it mentions these two sins. But it's not because those are the only two sins that matter. They're representative of the entire law. Every sin against another is in some sense taking something from them that doesn't belong to them, whether it's their, their possessions or adultery is taking someone else's wife, murder is taking someone else's life, envy is a, is a desire to take what they have and make it your own. Every, every sin against another is at some level a, a desire to steal from them, to enrich yourself of what you don't deserve and to take from them what they do deserve. Stealing stands for, again, all of our sins against one another. And swearing falsely, and our, our society has become so secular and, and so godless that we think of swearing falsely in terms of human relationships, too. I mean, it'd be very easy to just look at that. Okay, well, let's say lying. Everyone who lies. And that's not what it says. It says everyone who swears falsely. What we, we, we don't think about what we're doing. Um, if you ever have been in a courtroom uh, during a trial or if you watch anything from Perry Mason to Law and Order, um, you see witnesses being sworn in and they very quickly and, and rather casually most of the time, you know, put this hand on a Bible, and do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? And I do. Without any... What, what they're doing by swearing in 
is, is pledging, invoking God as a witness and a judge over them, that everything I'm saying is the truth. And if it's not, then, then may the Lord judge me. We live in a society that, that doesn't care about that, but in, in swearing, again, we are we're making a promise before the Lord. We're calling on the Lord to judge us, to judge the truth of what we're saying. And swearing falsely is hugely dishonoring to the Lord. It's, it's calling upon His name while actively disbelieving in Him, or at least disbelieving in His power or ability or willingness to judge. It's It's blasphemy. It's abusing his name. It, it's, it is also lying to other people, but so much more, it's, it's abusing the name of the Lord. I swear falsely. It's a sin against God. And those who do such things, again, are going to be destroyed by what's written on this scroll. covers the whole land and it seeks out everyone and it destroys everything. Verse 4, I will send it out, declares the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name. And it shall remain in his house and consume it, both timber and stones. There's, there's nowhere to hide from the curse of this scroll. No matter how thick your doors are, no matter how dark your curtains are, no matter how well your sins are covered and concealed and how, how good you are at, at hiding your tracks, this scroll, this curse will find you out and it will exact the curse on you, and it will consume you to death, and it will consume everything you have to death. And, and we know ultimately the end of this curse is everlasting death in hell if it reaches its full length. That's why Jesus told us, don't fear man who can only destroy the body and after that can do nothing to you, but rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. James, we're told that, that sin brings forth death. Romans tells us the wages of sin is death. The, the curse of the law is death for sinners. And we, all of us, are sinners. Even to say that, well, I'm not ethnically a Jew. I'm not related to any of these people who swore to abide by this curse. I I don't know where in my family genealogy, but surely they split off from Noah long before that, pre-Abraham. That doesn't excuse us from the curse. Romans tells us that all who sin under the law will be judged by the law, and all those who sin without the law will perish without the law. We're, we're all under the curse of sin because we're all descended from Adam. And Adam... Sin and death entered the world through Adam. Death spread to all men because all men sin. We are sinners. We are under the curse of the law, and it will destroy us utterly. And, and there's no way out of this curse by human effort. There is no provision made in the book, in the book of Deuteronomy for the people to escape the judgment once it comes upon them. Individual sins can be forgiven by the sacrifice of a bull or an ox. But once the judgment of the nation started, no amount of sacrifice, no amount of worship could lessen the severity 
or the length of the punishment. And Hebrews tells us that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That's why these sacrifices had to be continually offered forever and ever, and ever because they weren't enough and they weren't sufficient. And we don't even have a temple anymore where we can make sacrifices if we wanted to. And it's a sin to make sacrifices anywhere other than the temple where God set his name. And God has prevented the temple from being rebuilt because the sacrifices aren't enough. Nothing we can do can redeem us from this curse. Could my zeal no respite no? Could my tears forever flow all for sin? Could not atone? God must save and God alone. We're under the curse of the law, but God made a way out for us. God redeemed us Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We can't escape this flying scroll. It's too big, too fast, too powerful. But Jesus Christ has come into the world to take the curse upon himself to suffer it in our place, to bear all those curses we just read, to bear ultimately our destruction and our death so that we might live. It's the only way of escape. It's not a matter of cleaning up your life. You can't do it well enough and I want to make up for your past Anyway, it's not a matter of the right rituals. It's a matter of placing your faith in the one who paid the penalty for you. So, both in your own life and in your evangelistic efforts, you need to always remember First, that, that the curse wasn't just for those other people. It's not just them who are under the curse of God. It's us, too. We were under that curse. We were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. We we're all alike under this curse. And then we need to remember that it's not anything that I've done that's saved me from this curse. It's not that I was smart enough to get out from it and you're still stuck under it. We are saved by another. And he holds out his arms all day long, ready to save everyone who will look to him and call upon him and believe in him. It's not a matter of ritual. It's not a matter of work. It's a matter of faith. You believe promises of God. I know you do. Continue to believe them. Continue to remind yourself of them. Continue to hold out these promises to those around you. And when you stumble and fall into sin, the temptation, at least for me, when I sin, is to retreat from God and try to hide from Him just like Adam and Eve did, and, and try to clean myself up, and you know, at least wait long enough to feel like once once there's some time separating me from the sin, then I can come back into God's presence, and that's that's the worst thing we can possibly do. First John says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hebrews tells us that, that through Christ we now have access with boldness to the throne of grace, that we might find grace and mercy and help in time of need. When you've sinned, when you realize that you've sinned, when you realize that you have again 
made yourself worthy of these curses, deserving of these curses, that's the time to run the fastest and the strongest to Christ. He is the only way out from this curse. He's the only stronghold, the only shelter, the only hiding place that can deliver you from the judgment of God. Run to Christ and find in Him forgiveness and salvation and life. If you don't, if anyone else doesn't, so many refuse to come to Christ and be saved. Either because they don't believe in the curse, they don't believe in the necessity of someone else to deliver them from them, or because they just think their sins are so great that it's worthwhile. Those people will be found out they will be cleaned out to the end. They will be consumed, and everything they've built in this world will be consumed, and there will be nothing left for them. Christ, and Christ alone, delivers us from the curse by becoming a curse for us, by dying and conquering death. We might rise and live with him. The second vision deals more directly with wickedness outside of us. It's not the curse that we brought upon ourselves by our sins. It's a question of all these ungodly forces in the world arrayed against us. How should we understand them? How should we deal with them? There are evil people and evil kingdoms and evil forces in the world and it is promised way back in Genesis 3 when as part of the curse the Lord put enmity not just between the serpent and the woman but between the serpent's offspring and the woman's offspring there are two as, as A.W. Tozer put it, there are two separate species or races of humanity on the planet. There's the once born and the twice born. And they have utterly different goals and purposes and desires. And the once born hate the twice born. First John says, don't be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. It's your own deeds. Because their own deeds are evil and yours righteous. Darkness hates the light. But God knows this. He knows what we're going through. This vision speaks to that. Zechariah 5 5. Then the angel who talked with me came forward and said to me, Lift your eyes and see what this is that is going out. And I said, What is it? He said, this is the basket that is going out. And he said, this is their iniquity in all the land. And behold, the leaden cover was lifted, and there was a woman sitting in the basket. And he said, this is wickedness. And he thrust her back into the basket and thrust down the leaden weight on its opening. So this basket represents their iniquity in all the land. Not our iniquity, their iniquity. Now it is looking outside of the people of Israel, to the peoples around them. It's their iniquity, their sin, their wickedness. It's in a basket, and, and when the cover is lifted, there's a woman sitting in a basket, and the woman is wickedness. This does not mean that women are evil. It doesn't mean that you are somehow spiritually lesser, that you're responsible for all the evil in the world. It's just symbolism. Uh, sin is a feminine noun in Hebrew. But in Christ there is not 
male or female. There's not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised. Christ is all and in all. And outside of Christ, all alike are under the condemnation of sin. So it's not that women brought sin into the world. It's not that women are wickeder than men. It's nothing like that. The point of this vision here is that there is a real, tangible, evil wickedness in the world. And it, it's, it's active And it has power. And it has a place. This basket is carried by, by two women. Wings of a stork. Carried to the land of Shinar. Where a house is built for it. And, and the basket is set down. Shinar. Is the name of the plain. Where the tower of Babel. Was tempted to be built for the Lord and scattered their peoples and confused their languages. It's where Babylon stood in those days. It's currently Iraq. But again, just, just like the woman in the basket doesn't literally mean that women are, are evil. This basket being set down in Shinar and Babylon doesn't mean that all the evil in the world is you know, centered in Babylon or Baghdad. Um, the point is that there is a, a place for evil and it's in the world and it has a house and it has power and it has the ability to act. But in all this, none of that should be surprising. We, we see wickedness in the world all around us in, in the kingdom of Babylon. Isn't, it's not restricted to any nation, state, any region. It infects and, and controls multitudes in every corner of the globe. It will continue to do so until the very end of, of times when the apocalypse of John, the book of Revelation, comes to pass and the woes are unleashed, unleashed upon the world. And then, and, and only then, will we hear the, the eagle crying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Babylon, the, the land of Shinar, the home of wickedness, will not fall until that day it covers the whole earth. Again, New Testament, 1 John says that we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. It's the United States is, is not you know, God's country on earth. And it, it's not Iran or North Korea or Russia or China or any other country that's the land of wickedness. Wickedness controls the whole earth. But but consider again the beginning of this vision. The woman's in a basket. It's the angel who lifts the cover. It's the angel who thrusts her back into the basket and thrust down the cover again. And even though evil is real in the world, it is not nearly as powerful as God and his forces. He is in control. He is constraining evil. He is, is limiting its influence. He's limiting its power. He's limiting its ability to kill and steal and destroy It's, it's very, it's very real. 
but it's under the power of God. It only dwells where God allows it to dwell, and it only has the power God allows it to have. And it can't do anything that God does not allow it to do. He is, He alone is sovereign. We have a sure and certain promise that the kingdom of God, which is here already and which you are in, will triumph over the world. We are more than conquerors. We, we can be hurt by this evil. We can be dismayed by this evil. But we cannot be defeated or destroyed by this evil. Because, like, like we sing on occasion, before the throne of God above, have a strong and perfectly great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. And, and a little later it says, one with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. Christ, my Savior, and my God. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Whatever the world does to us, whatever wickedness seeks to do, it, it cannot overcome what God has done for us. The body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. We don't need to be afraid of the wickedness of the world. Whether it be foreign nuclear powers, whether it be people within our own country who so fervently hate the gospel. No matter how much they rage against the Lord, What would Psalm 2 say? The Lord laughs. He holds them in derision. They are a drop in the bucket before him. They, they can't do anything to thwart the plans of God. They, they can't win. God wins. So we need to live our lives. We, we need to live a disciplined and focused life, making the best use of time. We are waging a warfare against this kingdom of wickedness. But 2 Corinthians tells us it's not an earthly warfare. It, it doesn't involve missiles and bombs and drones. We have divine power to destroy strongholds. We defeat arguments and bring every thought captive to Christ. Our, our war is fought through prayer and obedience to scripture and, and the proclamation of the gospel. That's how we wage war against this, this wickedness. And we will win. God will when we are in God. We're in Christ. We are a part of that kingdom. We can't fail. No matter how scary the world seems, no matter how fierce and angry and powerful it seems, remember that it's contained and constrained and ultimately controlled by God. They can't go one step 
one inch beyond what God allows it to do. God is greater. God triumphs. So, and this this world is hostile to the gospel. It's going to become more hostile to the gospel. Last week, I saw. I've seen you know, for years lots and lots of articles written by all sorts of people calling Christianity just you know fantasy and, and, and make believe and nonsense. And today, well, not today, but this past week, uh, for the first time, I saw an article very explicitly putting forward that evangelicalism is white supremacism. It is racism. It's not just foolish. It's actively evil and it needs to be outlawed and done away with. Those kind of calls are going to, to grow and expand. Don't be afraid. The devil, the world, can't do anything to you but your all-powerful, all-loving Heavenly Father does not allow it to do. Don't be afraid. Stand firm. Stand fast. Stand boldly in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing to us the curse that we are under by our own actions, our own guilt, our own sin. We thank you for making a way of salvation for us through your Son. We marvel at the cost of our salvation. That our God would die for us. Help us to constantly cling to that salvation. To refuse to let go of the cross, to refuse to stray from the tomb and from your resurrected life. Let's never set our hope on ourselves, on the systems of this world, or on anyone in this world. And Lord, help us to strive side by side for the faith of the gospel, not frightened in anything by our opponents. You sovereign even over them in their rebellion against you. Lord, we know that nothing can happen to us that you do not allow. And we know that all things will work together for our good. That we might be conformed to the image of Christ. That we might share in his glory and his inheritance. Lord, we know the need around us. We see the world in ruins. Millions and billions of people without God and without hope in the world. We know that we have the only, the only message of salvation. Make us bold. Make us faithful. Make us fearless. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.